Teach us, Lord, to be masters of ourselves that we might be the servants of others. Take our hands and work through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. Good morning, church. Dear friends, we are breaking the rules this morning. You might as well know that we are. And I can think of a few more appropriate things to do on the weekend that we have celebrated the life and ministry of Jerry Moser than to break the rules. The former rector of this church, who was known, as we said yesterday, for his open theology. Now, of course, you don't really get to enjoy the thrill of breaking the rules unless you know what rule it is you're breaking. And my guess is very few of you, maybe none of you, except the clergy who are present, know what rule it is we are breaking. And so, if you promise not to tell, or post it on Facebook, I will tell you. Today we are breaking the rules of precedent. What is that? The rules of precedence are the rules that establish which celebrations, when they happen, take over Sunday morning. There are seven feasts of the Christian year that take precedence of a Sunday. And now let's all go back to confirmation class, and you'll tell me what they are. Remember? Three of them always happen on a Sunday, and they are... Easter, I heard it, but you're clergy. Pentecost, and Trinity Sunday. Very good. One of them always happens on a Thursday, and it is Ascension. Very good. Three of them move around the calendar and may happen on a Sunday, but usually don't. And they are Christmas Day, Epiphany, and All Saints Day, which just misses Sunday this year. So those are the things that take over a Sunday. Otherwise, we do what the calendar tells us to do, except today, we're not doing it. We're wearing the wrong liturgical colors, we've read the wrong readings, we're breaking the rules of precedence, and when we do that, we are supposed to ask the permission of the bishop. But if you don't tell him, I won't either. Today we are observing the Feast of St. Luke, which happens tomorrow, but we're doing it today. We're not doing it just because Luke is the writer of the Gospel written in the best Greek. We're not doing it just because Luke, by writing both the Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, is the single author responsible for nearly a quarter of the New Testament. It isn't even just because his account of the birth of Jesus is the one that Linus says in A Charlie Brown Christmas. We're doing this because by long tradition, Luke has been remembered to Christian history as a physician. At the end of the letter to the Colossians, Paul calls him O Iatropos O Agatepo, the beloved healing one an idea that has come to be associated with Luke down through our history. And after all we have been through these past 18 months, it is certainly understandable that we would bend the rules a little bit in order to give ourselves a chance to reflect prayerfully on healing, on healers, on those who care for the sick and the suffering, but even more on how this long, strange season of pandemic and death has changed our understanding of what healing is, what it means to be healed, and of our own need for healing. We are all of us products of our culture of scientific medicine. Every one of us has been spared the pestilences that stalked our ancestors 
that early generations simply regarded as part of the risk of life, polio, measles, rubella, diphtheria, our understanding of health is shaped by the medical model of disease. A disease is a problem for medicine to solve, treatment is the solution, and cure is the outcome. But in all of that, we have lost track of what it means to be healed. One of the wisest things my supervisor taught me during the year I spent as a hospital chaplain was just these words. Many people leave the hospital cured who have not been healed. Healing isn't something that the medical model of disease gives us because healing involves not just our physical body, but our fundamental sense of wellness, our sense of wholeness, our body, mind, and spirit. Healing is holy business because it involves our wholeness. And that is likely why. With all the talking and listening and reading all of us have done over these past months about illness and disease and vaccinations and variants, we have not heard a lot about healing, because it is something outside the grasp of even the incredibly capable scientific tools that have given us the ability to fight this virus. Wellness is about more than treatment and cure. And so in your prayer this morning, ask yourself, what does healing mean for you? What is it? After all these months of lockdown and distancing and estrangement from each other and isolation, what is it that you need to have healed? What no longer feels whole? Certainly our sense of invulnerability has been damaged, although that may be a blessing in disguise. After all, we are not invulnerable. We are frail. And there is more danger in forgetting that than there is discomfort in being reminded of it. But you know, our social fabric has been damaged. The gentle bonds that link us together in friendship and community have been strained. We have been separated from each other, seeing each other in little two-dimensional boxes in the eerie glow of our laptop screens. It's not just me that needs healing. It is us that needs healing. Arthur Kleinman is a scholar I had the privilege of coming to know a little bit during my graduate school. Professor Kleinman trained as a doctor and a psychiatrist, and then he went back to graduate school to study social anthropology. Throughout his life, he's been interested in health and healing, understood as both an individual and a social, a cultural phenomenon. The way in which I came to know him was working as an editor on a collection of essays that he had gathered on an idea I hadn't even really considered before I sat down to read them. Kleinman's idea was that suffering, suffering is not merely an individual matter, but a social matter. The title of that collection of essays was Social Suffering. Essays written by scholars in medicine and public health and psychiatry and religion from all around the world. Kleinman's wisdom was that major social forces that shape and affect human welfare on a mass scale create an experience of suffering on a mass scale that can only be described as social, social suffering. We, brothers and sisters, are living through a moment of social suffering. It is not just it is not even principally the global medical impact of a virus that has now killed nearly five million people. Our social suffering from COVID has come about from the distances that have grown between us. 
from the disconnection we have experienced from our communities, our neighbors, our friends, from the fear that has engulfed us and that makes us wary of even the simplest encounter with another human being. That is the suffering we have felt. And this is the healing we need. We need to be healed of our fear. Fear is corrosive. It brings out the worst in people and in the societies we make. We need to be healed of our disconnection. We need to bind up the wounds that have been inflicted on our communities, on our friendships, on our church. So where do we turn to be healed from all of this? What is the source of our hope here? We honor healing today. We give thanks for the skills of healers, but where do we go to heal our society, our community? Where do we go to seek the balm that will heal our spirits in this time of social suffering? Did you notice that in that first reading Debbie read, after the first few verses that extol the work of doctors and physicians, suddenly there is this proclamation, God's work will never be finished. And from God, health springs over all the earth. Dear people of faith, there is our answer. Healing, wholeness, wellness, that is not the product of the medical model of disease. That is God's work. Healing is spiritual work. And that means it is a matter for the whole body of Christ, for us, the church. It may sound strange, but that doesn't mean it isn't true. We must be each other's healers for the suffering that we've been through. We must reach out to each other. We must weave ourselves back together again. Because we are followers of Jesus, we must be on the lookout for those who have so suffered from the isolation and deprivation of these long months that they have forgotten how to be in community. Maybe they've even forgotten that to be human means to be in community. The Holy Spirit works in the world by working through us. And we must be the healing presence of that spirit for each other. Whether it is loneliness or isolation or fear or sorrow that has been your heaviest burden these past months, whether it was the loss of that sense of ourselves or the shattering realization of how frail we truly are, whatever it is, the spiritual work of healing those wounds is a task for all the people of God's church. And to do that work, we must come back together as people of this community. We have to dare to venture back out from the safety of our caves and renew the connections between us that make us a Christian community. I'm coming to the end. Just think about this. What if all this time of sorrow and loss, what if all these long, dark months of isolation and distance, what if all of that has been preparing us by God's grace for something? What if in all the harrowing of these days, we have been made ready for new challenges, new opportunities, new occasions that lie ahead of us? What then? We won't meet those challenges unless we meet them together. We won't address them fully as well as we might unless we knit ourselves back into our fellowship and include everyone around us 
who might be in need of that community. So let us be the healers for each other. Dear friends, let us recommit, reconnect, and renew our joy in being this gifted, loving, beloved community. And then, and then, when they look at us, they will know that God's work is still not finished because they will see it being done here. And when they listen, that day, they will hear this hope fulfilled in their hearers. Amen.